we come today once again in the name of your precious son, Jesus, the author of love, Lord Jesus. And we come to your word, your word, which is truth and life to those who find it. We ask you to bless your word to stand to each heart, for we ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. We ask and pray, amen. Today we'll be reading from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, beginning with verse 1. And that reads, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his precious word. Amen. So the important part that we want to bring out in this scripture today is about the abiding, which it means to be connected. We see the Lord using the analogy of a vine that the husbandman is the father, the overseer of the farm. He's talking about a farm, a vineyard. And if you can imagine the owner of that farm walking out to the vineyard, and that vineyard, which represents the body of Christ, which represents his church, Christ being the vine, and we, his church, being the branches. For he is truly our bridegroom, and we are his bride. And he uses this analogy to show us the importance of us being connected to him, to abiding in him. For surely the Father comes and he prunes that vine as we go through different stages of life, those of us who are, have found the Lord in our hearts and have received him and who are walking with him. When our lives are not connected to the vine, we find ourselves on the ground like a branch that has been disconnected. And if you've ever seen a branch that's been disconnected from a vine, when it's first disconnected, it still looks green, it still looks like it's part of the vine but give it hours or give it a day or two, and it begins to wilt. And today what he wants to focus on is wants each of us to look at our lives and consider, is our lives flourishing? Is your life flourishing mentally, spiritually, and physically? And yes, I know that some of us are in the winter of our lives because we're elderly. <laughs> But even though our bodies may be wilting in some degree because of our age, there's still that spirit of life within you that dictates and tells us, are we still, are we totally connected to his love? Meaning, do we have, are we nurturing this relationship with our bridegroom, with Jesus Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our life. It's the source of life itself. It's the source of fulfillment that we are searching for because we were all created for that fulfilled life, that life that is centered in his love. We all are desiring that Garden of Eden which we were put into originally through our parents, Adam and Eve. And Christ made a way for us to enter back into that redemptive love, into that place of fulfillment. And one of the things we have to focus on is what is in that place that allows us to be connected. You know, there's a certain part of the branch that actually connects you to the vine, your heart the center of your life. 
And see, the enemy of our soul is so cunning and he's very knowledgeable that he knows the benefits that come when we are connected to that, to the vine of Jesus himself. Because all the juices of life throw through that, throw into your heart, into your mind. So what does the old boy try to do? He tries to disconnect you. And how does he do that? Well, many times he will use good things, things that you call good, that we know are good, because he's a very deceptive being. He'll use things that you desire. For example, we all love our families. Our families are a big part of our lives. But when you look at society, you'll find that many in society put their family first before everything else. Before God. And what people don't understand is when we do that, anything that we put before God, and we're all looking to fill that spot. So we fill that spot with family. We'll fill that spot with alcohol. Searching for fulfillment. Searching to fill that our heart which is made for God's love. And don't get me wrong, I'm not preaching against family because once we're connected, when it's right, all these good things that the enemy tries to use to replace God with, God blesses abundantly more. In other words, you get to enjoy your family even better than you did before because they're in the right perspective. And we can go down the line with different things. It might be friends. It could be social status. It could be your work, your job. You're, an alcohol, you're a workaholic like I was. And we, begin, and we start to fill this spot, this connection with these things, trying to find fulfillment. Money, get all the bills paid. You know, the enemy uses so much, and there's not, it's not, money's not evil. It's the love of money. God said to love me first. To love your family, your neighbor second. And the enemy gets it all. He uses so many good things. Some of us might be sports fanatics. We can't. We're on these fan do things. And now you can gamble on, on your phone and online. And you get all caught. I mean, there's nothing evil with sports. Or go down the line with sex and everything. There's nothing evil about sex unless it's put or used out of the ways that God meant it to be. The same with money. God wants to prosper you. Some of the most, uh, most holiest men in the Bible were the richest. Abraham, Job, for example, David, Solomon. But it's where it's at in your life. Is your family controlling your life? Is your booze, your alcohol, your drugs, the sex? Well, go down the line. There's a lot of good things. And how cunning the enemy is to pervert it. To use it to separate you. Out of order. And, and why do we feel the way we feel unfulfilled? It's about that connection. We feel withered. We feel like that branch that's laying on the ground. We feel out of the loop. <clears throat> Unconnected to God. And there's a reason for it. A simple reason. 
because we are in a spiritual battle. The devil wants to separate you from the love of God. He doesn't want you to find the fulfillment of Christ. And he's very good at, at uh, making other things look so bright and beautiful. He tries to make it look like that's where the promised land is. That's the most important thing in your life. He dresses it all up. Puts a new coat of paint over it. He's not stupid. And sometimes we have, we've, we allow him to understand what our weaknesses are and don't think he doesn't try to take advantage of it. But we have the responsibility to bring those weaknesses under the blood of Jesus Christ. To involve and invite Christ into our lives to help us, to strengthen us so that we can reside in that hedge to where you're not bombarded by temptation day in and day out, where you're not oppressed by evil. Because see, when you're separated from God, you start to get oppressed. You start to fall into fear, into worry, into discontentment, into frustration. Do you read that in the Word where the fruits of the Spirit are frustration, depression, anguish? Is that part of the fruits of Jesus Christ? Fear, doubt? Is that a part of it? And how many of us fuss with that on a daily basis? Why? What is truth in your life? You see, the Israelites dealt with this. And this is one of the biggest problems in the world today with Christianity is so many of us are caught in the desert. Dealing with the word of obedience to Christ. Obedience to his word, obedience to his way. Because of a lot of good things. We want quail. We want water. We want comfort because we're dealing with the desert in our lives. And a good old boy exploits that with your flesh and your desire. Look at the Israelites because God shows us in the natural the process of what we deal with our spiritual lives. They have a salvation experience, the Red Sea parts. It's a supernatural event. They walk out of bondage. Their bondage, the Egyptians are destroyed in the sea and they're separated from it. They are now heading to the promised land. But they're being tested. Just like each of us are being tested. Those of us who have come into the knowledge of Christ are being tested to your love. What do you love more? Your flesh? Do you love these good things more than you love God? What do you think the Israelites were being tested with? Because it was in the desert they were given the law. And they could have walked into the promised land in 40 days, not 40 years. <clears throat> but what happened? They got bogged down. How many of us in our walks feel we're bogged down? We remember being saved. We remember highlights at times where we really felt God's presence, his voice in our life one way or another, a miracle, a prayer answered, but suddenly we're bogged down like a tank in a swamp and can't get any traction. Something's going on. What is it? And it gets back to what we're saying about we're in a desert. It gets back to that connection of what is God saying to me? Who let, he let Israelites rot in the desert. 
Because he means business. He's not a phony. If he says to get into the promised land, I need your obedience, he means it. He means it. And we see the evidence of two people, Caleb and Joshua. God announced to them, get up Israel, go and possess the land. Oh, wait a minute. That might create persecution. <clears throat> that might be very difficult to do. Just like us, when God's asking us to turn, to reposition ourselves, to turn away from something, to reposition our lives, to put him before something else in our life. That might be difficult to put him before my family. That might be difficult to put him before my job. That might be difficult to put him before this desire in my life. Oh, really? All right, well then, you can stay over there if you want. Usually the thing that we put before God ends up cursing our lives. It's where a lot of our problems filter into our lives. That's why we can find God's will many times in our circumstances in life and in our environment because the scriptures don't lie. And each of us, as we enter into Lent next week, it begins. Should bring ourselves to the place to re-examine our walks, to reassess which Lent is all about. So what is God saying to me? Where am I at in the scriptures? Have I entered into the promised land? Have I truly experienced, can I get up in the morning and enter into his peace? Oh, yes, we're going to all fall short in a day, but can I go back to him in that day and truly repent and enter back into that peace? Do I experience and can I live in the joy of the Lord regardless of my circumstances? And am I able to love others and forgive others who have hurt me? Am I truly connected? Or am I fooling myself? Or has the devil hoodwinked me into believing that I'm just, this is as good as it gets? Take a pill. Help the anxiety. Help me to sleep. Is our relationship grown stagnant? Is that where you're at? Because if it is, God can bring you out of that. And what does that involve? It involves as to what is God saying to you? I can't tell you what God's saying to you exactly in your life. Only you can answer that question. Am I connected? The Holy Spirit can certainly identify and help you sort out those things that have gotten in the way of that connection. Terry, uh, Corey Tam Boone used an analogy of a flashlight, of your light shining for Christ. And she used a flashlight and she went to throw and says, oh, wait a minute, there's something wrong. She pulled out a piece of paper, lust. Tried it again, wouldn't work. Anger. Tried it again, wouldn't work. Unforgiveness. She kept doing it. Fear, doubt, until she got all these things out of the connection between the bulb and the battery. And all of a sudden, boom, there's the light. You see, Lent, as we enter into it, is a time of repentance. Between you and God, it has nothing to do with me. I have my own business to deal with. 
if you don't think the enemy tries to distract me in a day, and I'll end with this as an example, in my life, he's had me start to go part-time at work. And anyone that knows me, I'm like a workaholic. I'm always doing something. I like to work. I enjoy it. Work's good. Jesus said, sweat at your brow that you may reap the fruits of the earth. Okay? So I like it. Again, the devil tries to use something and exploit it and tries to get you to overdo it, to miss something better that God has for you. So as I entered into semi-retirement, which my days off are Tuesdays and Fridays, I go into Tuesday and I got a list of things I want to do. And I always try to go into prayer in the morning to pray and seek his guidance. And what do I get from him? I don't want you doing any of that stuff. I want you to sit before me that I might deal with you. That's very, it's very hard for me to sit still and let God deal with my heart. <coughs> and as I begin to, to be obedient to that, at first I felt guilty. What, I'm just going to sit here like a bump on a log? I remember my father years ago calling lazy people and you know, a lot of guilt comes into a guy like me when you do that. Like, I should do something today and be productive. I can deal with going on vacation for a week because it's a vacation, but to do that during the week when I'm not on vacation, it's a change. And it's a cross. But the thing I have to share is as I sat before him, I begin to see a whole different life on being unveiled that I should be living in that involves peace and rest, true rest, where the battle's over. And you're not struggling. Wow. I do want that. That's what we're working for. And I'm and I was misdirected in my life in many ways. Yeah, I touched on it, but God's opening this door for me to live in his rest and his peace. And there's a bubbling of joy that starts to just grow within you. It's like you're baking a dish that's gonna be wonderful because it's real. Because certain things that were causing anguish and fear and doubt that I'd fight in my life was now being dissolved. And a true trust of Jesus Christ was now coming into my life as I stepped into this different direction with him. to be more connected. And that same opportunity is for you. So let's pray today. As we step into Lent, as we step into the future of our lives, each of us have a desire to live in that rest to where It's finished. The war is over. Lord Jesus, we identify that we are weak vessels, each of us. That's why you came at the cross. But you also have opened the door for us when you went to the cross, that we have a direct line to the throne room, that we can be connected to you in your grace and in your love. And we may ask ourselves, where do I find this? How do I, what's the first step? We read that to you in the third scripture. He said, ye are all clean 
through the word, his word that I've given you, his word for you. What is that word? Because that's where you'll find your cleanliness. That's where you'll find your connection. The same word that he gives, it's his word that he gave to the Israelites in the desert. That word that they believed that took them across the Jordan into the promised land to possess it, it was a word for them, designed for them, because you are an individual in Christ Jesus. What you're dealing with may not be the same thing I am. But you can find that word in Jesus Christ. To seek it. And once you seek it, to grab onto it and apply it to your life. When the Lord told me to sit down and do nothing, I had a choice. To go about my business of the day and visit this one and go to the store and all this other stuff. That's what he was asking of me that day. What is he asking of you? I don't know, but he does. And the Holy Spirit can show you. If you ask him to show you. So Lord, we pray for the grace today. To reveal to each of these. Out of your great love for them. How they can continue their lives. Whether... Some here may have already gone through. They may be experiencing your peace and your joy and your rest in the promised land. And God bless them. They've made the sacrifice. But there are some that may feel bogged down. And they need to be pulled out of that. And it's those today that we're speaking to. Meet them. Lord, as we, as they seek you, because your word says if we seek you, we'll find you. Help them, Lord, to receive and be embellished in your love. To be awakened. That they may truly enter into your rest. And if there be anyone listening to the sound of my voice. If you never had that experience with Christ, if you've never taken the first step, if you've never invited him into your heart to be Lord of your life, to forgive you your sins, this is an opportunity to do just that because he's alive and he's a spirit and you can receive him in your heart today. He promises not to turn you away if you're sincere. Just merely ask Jesus to forgive you your sins. Call upon him. Pray in Jesus' name and invite him into your heart to be Lord of your life. Ask him to fill you with his Holy Spirit. He promises not to turn you away. And now I pray the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. May he bless your coming in and your going out, your rising up and your lying down in your laughter and in your tears, in your work and in your leisure until that great day when you stand before him where there's no sunset and no dawn. May God impart to each of us his richest and deepest blessings. And we ask all these things, Father, in the holy and precious name of Jesus, we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. And just to remind